Nick, uh, if I may, um, you have written uh, at length recently about uh, the topic of justice and human rights mm -hmm. and suggested that um, human rights uh, talk, uh, the conceptualizing about human rights is most at home in a theistic context, uh, in, in a theistic metaphysic, and uh, have argued that the, the prospects for giving a secular grounding for human rights are dim, uh, or that there, are, that there are deep difficulties here at any rate. George, I know that you've uh, done some thinking about this, and, and uh, you uh, have thought that perhaps the golden rule could function as a kind of grounding for human rights that would be available to both secular and religious uh, thinkers. And so I wanted to have a, a, a brief conversation between the two of you about this topic. Maybe you could tell us some, George, about your view, and Nick, we'd be curious to hear what you have to say in response. Well, no, thank you very much. Uh, Maybe I should begin by saying that uh, I, I don't have a well-developed position. I, it's more like a thought experiment, and uh, uh, there, I've never really written anything more than a brief article about this. It's just a sketch, and uh, certainly uh, th there are many questions that I would have to think through and answer I if I were to try to take it further. But if I can interrupt, that may be true, but George is a terrific actual defender of human rights in all kinds of areas. He's done terrific work there on the right not to be tortured and so forth. Um, yeah. so, so I want to pay you, George, that tribute. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I am the founder of the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. Uh, we got started in 2006. I, I'm still uh, very involved uh, in that work uh, right up t uh, to the present. So uh, I do have a history of activism uh, in this area, and uh, I, I read a book by uh, Michael Perry, I think it's called The Idea of Human Rights, and you know, Perry t takes a line uh, that only a religiously grounded understanding of human rights could have uh, universal significance. So th there are a number of views out there that claim that you have to have a specifically religious or Christian standpoint in order to give a proper grounding for human rights. Uh, Jeremy Waldron, a uh, distinguished legal scholar and philosopher, ha has taken a view. And of course, uh, our own Nick Waltersdorf, uh, whose views I admire enormously, uh, has also taken a version of this. Not that these three have the same view exactly, but uh, you know, th there's a family resemblance there. And uh, I didn't know about Waldron and uh, uh, Nick's views on, the, on this question uh, when, I, when I first started formulating my own, but Michael Perry uh, said two things. First, that only uh, a religious or Christian understanding could give a grounding for human rights. And, and second, he had a problem in uh, the way he developed his argument about how you could get from uh, figuring out what uh, proper ethical standards would be on the one hand and how to get people committed to them on the other. So since most of the people that I find myself uh, rubbing shoulders with and working with in the human rights field don't seem to be Christians, uh, this was troubling to me because it, uh, you don't want to discourage people who are uh, uh, so devoted and uh, uh, you know, often operating at a pay scale lower than they could uh, uh, get if, if they were doing something else uh, with their, their training. And uh, I mean, there's very admirable people that, that one finds who either implicitly or explicitly take no religious view whatsoever. So I, it just seemed to me it would be troubling to discourage such people to say you don't have a proper grounding for the way you're spending your life. And on the other hand, there's so many Christians who don't seem to care much about uh, human rights and, and certainly about torture. That's why I started uh, doing the work I'm doing. I, it was just uh, very troubling to me that there was no real outcry uh, after uh, the exposure of the Abu Ghraib photographs and the uh, uh, revelations of the extent of U.S. involvement uh, 
uh, in torture, and you know the, the torture program that was instituted after September 11th. Uh, so th there aren't enough Christians, even though they're supposedly in, in a better position than others to be involved uh, in human rights and opposing uh, abuses like uh, torture. Uh, and then you have people who aren't supposed to have a proper grounding who are involved. So uh, th these were some of the things that were going through my mind. And I had uh, been reading a little bit uh, in the philosophy of Robert Brandom. He's a very difficult philosopher, and I, I can't claim to have a really solid grasp of uh, what he's trying to say, especially when he goes off into Frege and things like that. But uh, and he has this very interesting uh, approach. It, it's, it's a kind of pragmatism in, in parts of the argument. And it, it, he's thinking more about epistemological questions than he is ethical questions. But it's the same sort of thing. You know, philosophers have a question of, well, how do you connect uh, the perceptions of the mind with reality? You know, so, I mean, you, you can get a, a sense of people have knowledge about certain things, but how does it apply to reality? And Brandom's approach essentially is that they're already connected in practices. So you, you don't have to build that connection. It's already present. Uh, in the way we go about uh, living in the world. And what you have to do is make explicit the epistemological commitments that are implicit in our practices. So he calls these practices discursive practices, a, a term we'll have to come back to. He tries to, you know, in a very sophisticated and elaborate way, uh, think about how you can go from what's implicit to what's explicit. So th there's a, an inferentialist, uh, is the word that sometimes, an inferentialist process there. You, you infer ideas that are uh, explicit uh, from these implicit practices. So I thought, well, could we do something like that with uh, ethical standards? And, and could we offer uh, a kind of pragmatist interpretation of the golden rule uh, due to others as you would have them do to you. Well, it seems to me that we're already committed to certain moral standards in the practices uh, of everyday life. Uh, that is, uh, I don't like to be treated unfairly. And if somebody treats me unfairly, I have feelings about that. You, you don't have to first convince me that there's such an idea as fairness and that I ought to adopt it uh, for thinking about particular cases. Uh, I'm already thinking about it in my own case. Now, it may well be that I don't have an adequate understanding of what fairness amounts to. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a second question. But in principle, I have some notion of fairness. And I don't like to be uh, humiliated uh, or you know, put down somehow. Uh, so I, I have some basic uh, standard in my own case of respect for persons. And uh, if I am in dire need and somebody is in a position to help me and they just ignore me and, and walk on by, uh, I also uh, think that something is, is amiss. Uh, I, I th so I, I also have then, uh, on this account, uh, uh, at least a rudimentary understanding of benevolence or beneficence. So I mean, I think that's quite a lot. I mean, you can get a, a, a a notion of fairness, you can get a notion of respect for persons, and you can get a notion of beneficence uh, about how you would like to be treated in your own case. And, and I think this is just a, a general feature of uh, human life, that, that people uh, ha would like to be treated in a certain way, and when they're not treated in that way, uh, they have ideas about uh, what's happened to them and, and feelings about it. So you don't have to get people committed. So that solves part of Michael Perry's problem. You know, in practice, I'm using these standards in my own case. And the golden rule tells me I am not entitled to use these standards in my own case unless I'm willing to extend the very same standards uh, to the case of others. So I, I shouldn't uh, uh, be uh, indifferent to others when they're treated unfairly or when they're 
humiliated or when their basic needs are met and uh, there's a, a reasonable way in which those needs could be met if somebody cared enough uh, to meet them. So, so uh, to that extent, you can interpret the golden rule from this Brandom-like perspective and look for the values in this case that are implicit, uh, the moral values, in the judgments I'm making about how I'm treated uh, by others uh, in everyday life. And then you can go from there and reflect on uh, how uh, uh, these standards would apply uh, to, to other cases. I don't know exactly uh, the full definition of discursive practices for Brandom. He has this idea of scorekeeping and so on. It, it's, it's, uh, I don't know that I have a, a strong grasp on it. But I, I think the idea of discursive reasoning goes back to Aristotle. And he contrasted it with intuitive reasoning. So intuitions and intuitive reasoning had to do with opinions. So I might have opinions about what fair treatment would be in my own case, you know, what uh, uh, respect for persons would be, my person, and uh, beneficence and, and so on. But discursive reasoning would then be uh, a communal process of dialogue in which we would discuss what would really count for an adequate definition of fairness uh, uh, and so on. So just because I have an opinion about fairness doesn't mean uh, it's, it's a finally defensible or, or valid uh, definition of fairness. And it would be kind of an ongoing conversation back and forth where you could try to develop uh, an ever more uh, adequate and uh, sophisticated and refined understanding of what fairness would be, you know, what its possibilities and limitations are, uh, uh, and so on. But, uh, I mean, th that's the basic idea. There, there, you know, then there are all sorts of objections, you know, standard objections to golden rule thinking anyway. But you know, th th those were my basic intuitions. And I thought, you know, if, if this works, then there would be uh, a good enough uh, grounding for uh, universal human rights uh, on uh, a non-religious basis. Uh, and you wouldn't have to convince people to adopt these standards. They, they're already adopting them. And I suspect, you know, some of my secular friends, you know, it, at some level, this wouldn't be the only thing influencing them, but, you know, th they may already have a fairly, uh, you know, good enough opinion, you know, concept of why they're doing what they're doing, and it could be interpreted whether they would or not in terms of the golden rule. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.